Merry Christmas to everybody. Look forward to saying that again tomorrow. We decided, as you probably noticed, um, in trying to come up with a plan for Christmas being on a Sunday, to do our Christmas Eve service a bit more like a standard service, and our Christmas Day service more like our typical Christmas Eve service, just so we could confuse everybody as much as we could. But I, I, we, I am looking forward to tomorrow, just an extended time of singing and prayer and brief uh, gospel meditation. Uh, but I, I do hope you have a wonderful remainder of your Christmas Eve, Christmas morning. Enjoy that with your family and friends as well. If you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter 9. As I mentioned last Sunday, this is going to be a part two of a two-part message. But if you're coming in for the first time, you're not going to miss much of anything. Uh, but I wanted to sort of spend time with Isaiah this Christmas season as a church and to look at what he had to say to us in his prophecy in chapter 9. So we did kind of an overview of the first half of the chapter last week. And then as I mentioned, we're going to zero in on some rich verses describing the person who came as a child. According to Isaiah, the child that came, the son that was given. We're going to zero in on his identity and the surprise of it. But let, let's read the whole first half of the chapter just for the context of it. We're going to focus on verses 6 and 7, but let's read the whole thing and just enjoy the, the background a bit. Verse 1 of chapter 9. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil for the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor. You have broken as on the day of Midian. Every boot of the tramping warrior and in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Taraji Henson is an actress, very successful actress. Some of you maybe have seen her. She's on, been on a couple of different successful television shows. She's going to star in a movie coming up about some ladies who were instrumental in the early NASA projects. She says the following. Every human walks around with a certain kind of sadness. They may not wear it on their sleeves, but it's there if you look deep. Unless we think that perspective is limited to this century with its frenetic pace, the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow speaks to us from the past, and he says almost an identical sentiment. Every man has his secret sorrows, said Longfellow, which the world knows not. Oftentimes, we call a man cold when he is only sad. Oftentimes, we call a man cold when he is only sad. Every human walks around with a certain degree of sadness. It's there, she said, if you look deep. That could describe the situation of 
people who had read this passage in Isaiah. If we read the beginning of the passage, it says there will be no gloom. That's because there was going to be a lot of gloom, a lot of darkness, a lot of sadness, a lot of depression, and actually depression that was rightfully theirs because of their sin. These were people that had abandoned God, and after many, many centuries of enduring their sin, God had, had finally abandoned them to exile. So they were gloomy. They were under contempt. And as I talked about last week, they were walking around, as it were, in darkness. That was their way of life, as it is the way of life for every human being who lives without the light they were meant to live under, that of Jesus Christ. I've used this illustration before, but the Bible considers uh, human beings to have been made for a, per a specific environment. It's, it's a little bit like a plant that was made to be out in the sun, but has removed itself into a, a cave or a closet and stays there. And for a while, the plant can look like it did, but eventually it begins to fade because it was made to be in the sun. It was made to drink in the light of the sun. Well, when you are far away from God and his presence, there's only one ultimate experience. That is gloom and sadness. And that's what Isaiah describes here. But Isaiah has good news. He says that that gloom doesn't have to linger. He would say to Taraji and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, that, that's true, there is a sadness, but it doesn't have to be your lifelong experience. And before we launched into this meditation on the person of Jesus Christ, I, I wanted you this morning, whether you're a Christian, whether you don't believe in Jesus, whether you just know about him, but you don't feel close to him right now, to think about a category, or maybe a couple of categories in your life where you identify an area of deep sadness, maybe even gloom. It's nagging, it's consistent, you try to ignore it and overlook it, but it lingers with you. Maybe it's a sadness because of something that has happened to you or your family, a sickness perhaps, or a suffering or an illness that, that just causes pain one day to the next. Or maybe it's a sadness because of a memory, something that somebody did to you that was wrong. They cheated you or they wronged you in some way. And that sadness just lingers. Or maybe it's a sadness because of something you did. That you remember and you regret and it's painful to think about. And, and though you don't think about it on Monday maybe or on Wednesday evening, all of a sudden, Thursday morning or next May, it, it drives into your heart again and you feel sad. Maybe you think about dreams you had that seem impossible now. Or maybe you think about your children and you're not sure whether or not they will ever turn to the Lord. All of us have some sadness if you look deep. Isaiah says there's actually good news for those who can relate to gloom. There's good news. There's good news, actually the angel said in the New Testament of great Joy. I think that's part of the reason we like surprises. I, I like surprises on Christmas. Um, I, I, my wife is very faithful about getting lists to people on Christmas. I don't particularly like Christmas lists um, because I prefer to buy things that, that they like that they never would have thought of getting. But people like lists, and so I, I follow the rules. But I like surprises. I like that look on someone's face when they say, how did you know? Or I can't believe I never would have thought of this or some kind of expression. Like they're shocked. When I was a kid, you knew it was a great Christmas present if mom cried. That was like the goal. So my brothers and I, we knew we had scored big if she cried. So we, she would cry and we would stand up and thump our chest and bump fists and say, yes, that was a surprise. Yes, we got her. We like surprises and I think the reason we do is we want to be surprised by joy. We know about sadness. We know about gloom. We know there's a certain pall over this world, but we want to be surprised by joy. That's what we want to be surprised by. That's what Isaiah is trying to do. He's trying to su surprise a gloomy people with joy. 
And that's what he's still trying to do this day. To Christian and non-Christian, he's trying to surprise us by joy. Now, I think there's, there's two surprises in the latter half of this passage, verse 6 and 7. The surprise of his identity, this son that is given, and the surprise of his kingdom. So two surprises, the surprise of his identity and the surprise of his kingdom. And both are designed to bring us good news of great joy. If you remember last week, the the structure of this passage, he talks about all the things that God's grace is going to accomplish. He's going to take them from from, uh, contempt into glory, from hopelessness into hope, from joylessness into joy. He's going to do that by removing their oppression, by removing all vestiges of conflict, and all of this accomplishment is going to be built finally on an individual that is introduced in verse 6. To us, a child is born to us a son is given. And then he meditates on this person. His whole goal is to speak to people who walk around with a certain kind of sadness and to say, I I have joy for you. I have joy for you. In your sadness, I want to speak joy. And so he starts unwrapping the surprise. The surprise of his identity we want to look at first. Look down there at verse 6. To us a child is born. To us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called. And at that point, every Israelite reading this would assume that he's talking about a kind of David-like king. And they would be excited about that. They hadn't had a lot of David-like kings. They had a lot of loser kings and evil kings and cheating kings and oppressing kings and selfish kings, but not a lot of David-like kings. So they would have been thrilled. Wow, this is fantastic. There's going to be a maybe a David-like king, and he's going to have the government again, and and maybe he's the one that's going to remove all this oppression. We face the Assyrians. We're going to face the Babylonians. You can imagine over the centuries them reading this as they faced the Greeks and what they did to the temple and then the Romans come rolling in and year after year you can imagine Israelite children reading about this and hearing the rabbi tell them, look, there's going to be a child one day and he's going to have a government on his shoulder and he's going to be like King David. But then the surprise comes about his identity. Because his name will not just be called Mighty Conqueror or Victorious One. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now here comes the surprise. This child, who will be a real child, it says he will be born in verse 6. He's not going to be a, an appearance a man or a, a phantasm or something. He's going to be a, a real human being, but he's going to be called Mighty God. And Isaiah affirms this name for him. He's going to be God and a born child at the same time. Now, that's a surprise. No Israelite reader would understand how that could be possible and it not be blasphemy. Of course, we can benefit from 2,000 years of church history and the rest of our Bible and understand he's describing the glory of the incarnation. He's describing what we celebrate on December 25th every year. A child called mighty God. It's an impossible mystery. The deeper you look into it, the more astonishing it becomes. Now, there's some wrong ways to think about the identity of Jesus. There's some wrong ways to think about it. One wrong way to think about it is that he was a man who was used as an instrument or representative of divine power. He was a a king of superhuman strength or divine anointing, you might say. He was like a titan. Or you might think of of Hercules, half man, half God. He accomplished great and powerful things. That's how a lot of religions would think about Jesus. I, I can't deny he was mighty and strong and powerful. God must have endowed him with unusual ability. One wrong way to think about who Jesus is. He's not a child who would look like God. Another wrong way to think about it is that he's God the Son. He's a God, but he just appeared to be a man. He took on the sort of appearance. He looked like a man. 
He took on sort of the form before our eyes of manhood. He wasn't a real man. He took on the form of man. Now, now, depending on your background and your religious tradition, one or the other of these might seem a lot more familiar to you. You could ask yourself this question. Am I more used to thinking of Jesus as God, deity, to be worshipped? Or am I used to thinking of Jesus as man, vulnerable, weak, human, in the same way that I am human? Which of those seems a little more odd to you will be affected by your background, your religious, what you've taught, been taught, what your parents taught you, what you grew up thinking about. But the scriptures affirm an astonishing parallelism that Jesus was at the same time fully man. He, he wasn't a sort of man. He wasn't a kind of man. He wasn't just a really strong man. He, he was truly, fully man. He was a man. He breathed. He bled, he was weak, he was vulnerable to illness and sickness. He was a man. He experienced all the things that men and women experience, all the temptations they experience, all the sense of vulnerability that they experience. He was a man. He had to learn things as a child. He had to learn to walk. He didn't, you know... <laughs> come out flying. I mean, he had to learn to, to talk. He had to learn about the, the traditions of the Jews. He had to submit to his parents and obey, sometimes when they were right and sometimes when they were wrong. He was a man. He was fully man. He wasn't less than a man. His manhood was genuine. It was real. He experienced the full amount of utero development. He experienced the vulnerability of birth. He experienced the helplessness of infancy. He experienced that fully, truly, unmitigated. And all of that being true, he was and is God the Son. Now, the longer you think about this, the more miraculous and surprising it becomes. God has no vulnerabilities. He has no weaknesses. He never learns anything because he knows everything. He is never surprised. He is never taken by surprise. And he experienced being a four-week-old child in a woman's womb. He experienced hunger that his human mouth could not express in vocabulary. So he cried. He experienced learning to walk with limbs that didn't know how. Though as God the Son, he held the universe and every atom by the word of his power. This is the glory of his incarnation. It is a glory beyond our comprehension. God becomes man. It is an eternal connection. When Jesus became man, he became man permanently. This is the theological truth that we affirm as Christians. He didn't become man temporarily. He didn't become man merely to accomplish his earthly mission. He became man to permanently become the mediator between God and man. So God the Son permanently united his divine nature to the nature of a human without diminishing or transforming either in their essential nature and yet existing, cohabiting, as it were, in the same person, Jesus Christ. So our orthodox confession is that there is one person with two natures, fully human and truly God. Astonishing.
It's an astonishing truth. So when Isaiah says to us, a child is born, to us a son is given, and his name shall be Mighty God, he's declaring that God has done what no one could have imagined, certainly no Jew could have imagined, who were forbidden to even paint a picture of God. God has enfleshed himself. God has united himself with a human nature. God the Son has become man without ceasing to be God. And being God, his incarnation uh, gives rise to his character as deity being expressed through the mission of a man. Notice these names. This is the second surprise of his identity. The first is the fact that he could be God and man. The second, that as God, he can express the nature of God through his manhood. He will be, this man, this child will be, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. Think about those names and what good news it is that there is a man who can exist and does exist in the, in the deity of <laughs> that is God the Son, that can be these things for his people. Wonderful counselor means he embodies in himself the wisdom of God for his people. He's not bound by the wisdom of this age, by the limitations of human philosophy. He is the wonderful counselor, able to bring true wisdom to all who need it. He is mighty God. He's not just God. He is God in all of his strength and fullness, able to save his people able to rescue them. This would call to mind all of the mighty acts of God's salvation in the past. The exodus from Egypt, the deliverance from Mid Mid the Midianites, and all of the mighty things God had done are going to be expressed and revealed in this God-man. He's the everlasting Father, and that doesn't confuse him with God the Father. It's speaking in human terms and saying he's going to be the protector, the provider, the source of a people that will owe everything they have to him the way a child owes everything it has to its father. And he will provide for those that have no other father ultimately to look to. He will take them into a home as it will. And he will be the prince of peace. And I mentioned last week, this doesn't just mean internal calm or some sense of psychological well-being it, it, it means that you have been brought into a, a circumstance of, of God's blessing in your life and in your soul. It, the word is shalom. It's not just peace as in a, a little bit less conflict. It, it means God's well-being has been poured out on you. And all of this is going to come about through this God-man. The, the name of this man, the names describe his character, what he's going to accomplish for his people. So this God who became man will be a wonderful counselor. He will be mighty God for his people. He will be the everlasting father for his people. He will be the prince of peace for his people. This is the surprise. This is the surprise of Christmas. So to everyone who walks around with a little bit of sadness or that sense of gloom that is attached to some regret, pain, circumstance you can't relate to, there is someone who has been given who has the power and capacity to reverse ultimately that sadness and turn it into joy. There is someone who has the sympathy to understand sadness and the power ultimately to reverse it. There is someone who has the capacity to relate to and sympathize with our weakness and yet the deity to overcome those things that caused it in the first place. There is a mediator, a meeting place between God and man. And it's not a place, it's a person. It's the God-man, Jesus Christ, the son that was given. That's the surprise of his identity. Secondly, the surprise of his kingdom. Notice what it says about what will take place in his kingdom. It says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no ends. So that means his rulership will never diminish. It will only increase. And related to the increase of his authority will be the increase of that shalom over all of creation. 
So the government that will never fade or never end will bring about a well-being for all of those that are included and invited to join it. And there will be no end to that increase. It's a kingdom that will fulfill all of God's covenant promises to his people because it's going to be on the throne of David and over his kingdom. It's not going to be some new novel kingdom. It's going to be God demonstrating that he is faithful to his promises and he will provide a son, as he told David, to sit on his throne and bring about the promises of the kingdom that he told his people he would give to them. And notice the character of this kingdom. It's going to be a kingdom of justice and righteousness and permanence. Justice meaning this is not going to be a corrupt kingdom. There's not going to be any bribery in this kingdom. It's not going to be a kingdom where evil and darkness can triumph in the end, where weakness and vulnerability ultimately have no rights or power. No, no, not, not, not in this kingdom. In this kingdom, there's going to be justice. So wickedness will be abolished and good will be rewarded. In this kingdom, there's not going to be any uh, unfairness taking place or injustice. There'll be no impurity marring this kingdom. There'll be no uh, looking out of this kingdom and saying, oh, it's, it's mostly wonderful, but there's this one section that's just rife with crime and misery. Not in this kingdom. It will be a kingdom of justice. There's not going to be anyone in this kingdom who says, oh, it, I, 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 haven't, I haven't received anything. I'm left alone and afflicted, vulnerable to evil enemies, and I have no one to protect me, not in this kingdom. This kingdom, there will be justice, literally, for all who are included. No one will be forgotten in this kingdom. No one will be overlooked in this kingdom. No one will be uh, undermined in this kingdom. No one will be slandered in this kingdom. No one will be gossiped against. No one will be falsely accused in this kingdom. No one will be downtrodden in this kingdom. No one will be uh, taken out of their, their home and, and thrown into jail for no reason in this kingdom. This is the kingdom that he will establish. This is the kingdom of justice and righteousness and permanence. So all of the goodness of living under this peaceful authority will not last temporarily or maybe just for a generation. It'll last forever. So no one in this kingdom ever has to worry about the threat of invasion. You never have to worry about decay or decline or maybe the next king not upholding the values of the previous king, or what happens when there's eventually a person on the throne who forgets to be vigilant. No, this, this kingdom is going to be this way forever. Peaceful, righteous justice will characterize it the day it begins to the day it ends, and it will never end. No evil within will topple it. No power without can threaten it. It will last forever. Now, here's the biggest surprise of all. Why is this good news? Why is it good news? It's easy because we like ourselves and we're impressed with ourselves to assume it should be good news. But of course, that means we assume we're invited. We assume we can participate, doesn't it? Don't you read these verses and you just automatically assume, oh yes, that's meant for me. Have you ever seen a child where the parents bringing something out to give to someone and the child just runs up ready to grab. Yeah, that's meant for me. I mean, why wouldn't it be? No, no, that's, that's not for you. I find myself saying this all the time to my little, my little one-year-old now. That's not for you. Because <laughs> he wants everything, it's not for him. Electronical gadgets and outlets and chokeable things, money, coins. I say it over and over again. No, that's not for you. That's not for you. That's not for you. That's not for you either. Do you realize at the end of this passage, there could be a verse that says, that's not for you. I'm just letting you know. After all, this is written 
to those who had decided God wasn't as worthy as sticks of wood and pillars of stone. It's written to people who had decided that God wasn't as trustworthy as they themselves were in seeking out human support from other kinds of kingdoms. That's who it's written to. It's written to people who had said to God over and over again, we don't think it's nearly as fun following you as it is following all these other religions that allow us to do all these exciting, dangerous, sinful things. It's possible that at the end of this passage there could be a verse that says it's not for you. That's what makes this so surprising. The passage is written to sinners. The passage is written to those facing exile, facing judgment, facing destruction. It's written to those who do not deserve to be in a kingdom of justice and righteousness. Isn't that the major problem with a just, righteous, peaceful kingdom? It's that any single person that goes into it with their sin would harm and ruin it eventually? Isn't it right for a sinner to say, well, if it's a just, peaceful, righteous kingdom, then surely me and my selfishness and my greed and my pride do not belong there. It's not for you. But this is precisely why it says that a child was given who was mighty God. This is why God can say to sinful people, it's good news that I'm going to establish a kingdom of righteousness, justice, and peace. It's good news for you. It's good news for you that there's going to be that kind of kingdom. It's good news for you because you, guess what, can be included. And the automatic question on everybody's mind should be, how can I be included in a kingdom of peace, justice, and righteousness? Have you seen what I look like this week? When I didn't get my way, I don't belong in a kingdom like that. And God says, you will. And let me tell you how. Because God sent his son as a child. And there's only one reason God would possibly do that. Why would God come as a child? Why didn't he just establish the kingdom from heaven for all of those angelic beings who have always followed him perfectly? Why did he come as a child? Why did he come as a son? Why did he have to link his divine nature with the nature of a vulnerable, weak man, perfectly human yet without sin? Why? Well, so that he could say this kingdom it's good news for you. There had to be a way for the judgment of God on unpeaceful, unjust, unrighteous people to be brought into a kingdom of peace, justice, and righteousness. And the only way was if a man could experience the judgment of God on sin so that that judgment was passed forever into a grave and those people who used to be under judgment could hear instead of, this is not for you, this is for you. Unto you is born today in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Charles Spurgeon says, incarnation prophesies salvation. It prophesies salvation. It is the only reason for Jesus to become man. There is no other reason for him to do so unless he wanted to be able to say to people, the kingdom I am establishing is good news. Because without that, it's bad news. It's disappointing news. It's outcast news. It's outside the gate news. It's news of a party that you can't join. It's looking in at a window when you can never be inside. It's that kind of news. 
But Jesus coming as a man says it's open door news. It's come in news. It's you have a seat at the table news. It's I've prepared a feast for you news. It's good news for one reason. Augustine said it this way, man's maker was made man that he, ruler of the stars, might nurse at his mother's breast, that the bread might hunger, the fountain thirst, the light sleep, the way be tired on its journey, the truth might be accused of false witnesses, the teacher be beaten with whips, and listen, the foundation be suspended on wood, that strength might grow weak, that the healer might be wounded, that life might die. So that sinners might hear, it is for you. Every verse in this passage has the shadow of Jesus' death over it. Because only by his death is this good news. To us, a child is born. Why? Because God can't die, but a man can. To us, a son is given. And whose son is he? The God who so loved the world that he gave his son, that whoever believes in him should not die, but live. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, because in his wisdom there is a wisdom greater than the wisdom of this world. And he shall establish a kingdom based on his death and resurrection that is offered to all who will believe in him. So if you're a Christian and you're here celebrating the birth of your Lord and yet it's easy as it is for me, as it is for all of you to find it a very familiar story. Let's remember this joy is intended to spread to every pocket of sadness that lingers in your heart. So let's go back to that memory. Where are you sad right now? Be honest with yourself and with the Lord. Regret, suffering, sin, relationships, children, pain. He has established a kingdom where people like you and me can have our sadness banished because he's buried the cause of it in the grave. If you're here and you don't know a lot about Jesus and you're just here to have a nice time of singing Christmas carols. Let me encourage you, the ultimate message of Christmas is there is a joy for you in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a joy for your sadness. Look, even famous people, actresses and poets know that there's a deep sadness lingering in the heart of every human being. But the good news of Christmas is that the Lord has come. He became man so that he could die on a cross in the place of sinners like you and me and that all those that believe in him can claim his kingdom for themselves, can live in that kind of joy and don't have to live forever in this kind of walking sadness that we experience because we're far from the sunlight of God. If you believe in Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, you're brought out of the cave and into the sun of the joy he gives because he forgives your sin and he guarantees you a place in his kingdom forever. I bring you good news of great joy for all people. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you and we love singing and praying.
praying and declaring that you are the joy of our souls. And I pray right now, Lord, for every person who is aware of, of some aspect of sadness in their life. Lord, I pray you would bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, wherever they are weary, would you bring them the joy of knowing that you bore their griefs and sorrows on the cross. Wherever they are hopeless, Lord, remind them of the hope you purchased for them to bring them into a kingdom that will never fade. Lord, for all those who feel weak, Lord, would you be their strength? For all those who feel alone, would you be their refuge? For all those who feel convicted of sin, Lord, would you be their forgiveness? Would you comfort them with the assurance of your grace? Lord, we celebrate you and your coming as, Lord, this surprise of all surprises, the joy of all joys, the banishment of all sadness, the exaltation of glory revealed shockingly in the birth of a baby child. We rejoice in you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray and we sing. Amen. Amen.